Okay, uh, welcome. This is lecture 23 of digital design and computer architecture. And we're going to continue covering memory in this lecture and the remaining, I think we have three more lectures uh, left after this. And today we're gonna to delve into memory hierarchy and caches. And clearly this is a quite exciting topic in computing system design today. And we motivated the importance of it in the last lecture. And we discussed how most of the real estate of modern uh, chips is dedicated to memory hierarchy and increasingly memory hierarchy is going to be a bigger bottleneck. And we're going to talk more about that today, but uh, we're going to start with the basics of building a memory hierarchy and talk about caches. And then let's see how far advanced we can get. We may continue talking about caches in the next lecture also. Okay, uh, so uh, these are the readings. Uh, I added one more reading. Uh, this is a book chapter that we had written with one of my PhD students a while back on memory systems. And it's very accessible, in my opinion, uh, on the topics that we're going to cover uh, on memory hierarchy and caches. So I'd recommend people to read it. It should be very easy reading, actually. Uh, and I'm going to show you examples uh, from that reading. I'm going to reuse some figures uh, for this lecture. But the other readings uh, stay the same. Uh, we're going to talk about Morris Wilkes' seminal paper on uh, cache memories uh, in this lecture. So recall, I'm going to use uh, several slides to refresh your memory on what we talked about last time. We talked about memory organization, memory technologies, and we said that all memories look similar internally if you focus on the arrays and they're built as hierarchy of arrays. And this is one example array. Uh, that shows a bank, let's say. Uh, and you can see that it's two-dimensional and you have rows and columns. I'm not going to go into the details of it again. You can watch the last lecture again if, you're, uh, if you want to refresh your memory on how these arrays operate and how the cells operate and how they actually uh, work, essentially. But many memory technologies are similar. And we talked about SRAM as one memory technology. Uh, this is uh, compatible with logic. Uh, fabrication as a result it's used as cache memory integrated with the compute units uh, we also talk and you can see that the two-dimensional array structure is over here also and we talked about dram as another type of memory technology and we said that this is not compatible with logic because of the capacitor so fabrication technology is different as a result dram is uh, almost always off chip uh, compared to the processing units uh, and you need to go through off-chip interconnects to access it. And as a result, a lot of the design decisions made in DRAM chips uh, are dictated by the cost of the DRAM chip, as well as the cost of going off-chip, the pin count, for example. And we said that you, don't, you cannot provide full address uh, to a DRAM chip. Uh, you just provide the row address first and then the column address. Uh, and we also said that the data output is also smaller uh, you can get eight bits, for example, or four bits or 16 bits in existing DRAM chips. Okay, we also discussed the trade-offs between DRAM and SRAM and clearly DRAM is slower, SRAM is faster. So the speed uh, is a big trade-off and certainly density is a big trade-off. DRAM is higher density as a result, lower cost and SRAM is lower density and as a result, higher cost. We're gonna talk a lot more about this to build the memory hierarchy today. And this is going to be a fundamental thing that we're going to discuss basically speed versus size trade-off, but there are other trade-offs also across the memory hierarchy. We also briefly mentioned phase change memory because this is going to be more important into the future. Today, we're in 2021, uh, so we should really talk about this sort of technology uh, potentially uh, gaining its space inside the memory hierarchy. And I'm not going to go through the details of it, but this is a non-volatile memory technology that can potentially uh, replace parts of DRAM or augment uh, parts of DRAM and potentially replace also parts of SSDs or create another level in the memory hierarchy that we're going to discuss. And we also discussed the trade-offs between DRAM and PCM. And you can see that the list is longer over here because there are more differences uh, uh, that come into play like endurance problems in phase change memory, which doesn't exist in DRAM, at least to a practical level uh, that we know of today. Okay, so now uh, with that, we also talked about uh, the DRAM hierarchy. If you remember last lecture, we talked about how, how you can read a cache line uh, from a hierarchical DRAM system. And I'm not going to go through that. Hopefully you remember that uh, uh, at this point. Now let's talk about the memory hierarchy and the reasons for it. And uh, I, I think I showed you this picture earlier, but uh, as you look at a system today, and this is not today, this is 15 years ago, you can see that a large fraction of the 
real estate, hardware real estate is really dedicated to the memory hierarchy. So you see cores, L2 caches, L3 cache here, memory controllers, memory interface, and memory banks. And we're not even looking at, uh, I'm not even depicting the uh, regular L1 caches inside the cores over here. And there is a reason for it. We're going to talk today uh, that L1 caches are tightly integrated with the cores, but that's part of the memory system also. Register files are also part of the memory system as we will discuss today. And recall, I showed you this slide. This is one of the latest chips that we briefly discussed in earlier lectures. This is Apple M1. And you can see that a large fraction of the modern chips is dedicated to memory. You can see 12 megabyte caches here in the fast cores, high performance cores, four megabyte cache uh, in the efficiency cores, as they call them, a system level cache. And GPUs also have things that are not designated over here. And you can see the memory channels are also part of the memory hierarchy. So. Uh, if you extend this, you look at a chip like this. This is AMD Ryzen. It's one of the latest AMD cores, uh, AMD chips, I should say. And you can see that the uh, caches are growing bigger and bigger as well. This is what I uh, show over here is really the fraction of the chip in green uh, that is dedicated to L3 cache and L2 caches. You can see that's more than half over here. We're not even including the L1 caches over here. We're not even including the interconnect to go off chip. Uh, and also other uh, parts uh, that, uh, that essentially enable access to outside uh, world. So essentially, it's not an understatement when we say that uh, way, way uh, more than a half of a, DIA, a, a, half of a single chip, uh, CPU chip, is today dedicated to memory hierarchy. In fact, that's increasing. If you look at the full system, like if you look at the entire hardware cost, uh, Clearly, all of DRAM is dedicated to the memory hierarchy. So uh, clearly, most of your system design, uh, all of your SSD is part of your memory hierarchy. So clearly, more than 80%, uh, 90% of your uh, system is really uh, dedicated to the memory hierarchy. And this is just a computing chip, as we are looking at. This is another example. This is IBM's uh, server chip, Power 10. Uh, IBM has a lot of server lines, Z series also. I, I didn't uh, have time to get a good die picture of that. But you can see that IBM Power 10 is also uh, quite heavily uh, uh, using memory, uh, memory on the chip. You can see that the L3 cache is 120 megabytes. L1, L2 caches are 2 megabytes per core. And L1 caches are not even depicted over here because they're considered part of the core. And you can see that the rest is also uh, a significant fraction of the chip is for memory signaling and memory interface and other outside connectivity of the chip. So again, this is more than half clearly. And this is another example from NVIDIA Ampere. Uh, this is uh, the GPU that we discussed, A100 uh, cores. And you can see that this also has a significant memory hierarchy. We're going to talk about this more because there are some differences over here. GPUs tend to be more compute. Uh, you can see that the compute intensity in GPUs is higher than the other chips. So there are a lot of compute units also in GPUs. So memory, uh, at least in this particular picture, is not fully dominating yet, but it's increasing. Uh, you can see that the L2, L2, L2 caches are uh, becoming bigger, etc. I'm not going to talk about this uh, in detail at this point. Okay, but let's talk about uh, with that background, why is it happening? Uh, basically, we want ideal memory overall because we want zero access time to get our data so that we don't stall the pipeline. We want infinite capacity so that we don't run out of space so that the programmers don't go crazy. We're going to talk about that later on also. But having larger physical memory spaces is good so that you can fit more data in it. Uh, we want zero cost if possible, of course, and we want infinite bandwidth. Uh, so that we can support multiple access in parallel. Remember, in GPUs, SIMD engines, you want high concurrency, uh, many accesses per cycle if you have many uh, load units that are loading things at the same time. And vector processors, SIMD processors, GPUs are great examples of this. So you want all of this at the same time. And clearly, this is very greedy, right? This is idealism. And unfortunately, we, can get, we cannot get all at the same time, basically. Uh, the problem is ideal memories requirements oppose each other. And uh, let's take just two aspects of it. Bigger is essentially slower, and faster is more expensive. And this is very fundamental. Higher bandwidth is also more expensive if you want to take a third aspect of it, basically. So bigger is slower because bigger, if you, as you make the memory bigger, as we discussed last time, interconnects become longer, and it takes longer to determine uh, the location. Uh, even, even if you partition it to hierarchical arrays of arrays, uh, the overhead of the interconnect still increases, basically. So a bigger is slower, and there's no uh, way to get around it, basically. Uh, otherwise, it becomes magic, uh, basically. Faster is more expensive. So you may have a memory technology that's faster uh, than the other, uh, but it turns out it requires more area, usually, 
SRAM, for example, is a good example. SRAM versus DRAM uh, versus SSD versus disk versus tape. And uh, going from left to right, uh, your cost reduces, uh, but you also become slower, basically. So essentially, faster technologies are more expensive because they require more uh, to build uh, the uh, bit cell uh, that you're storing data in. And higher bandwidth is more expensive. As we discussed earlier, if you want to get higher concurrency, higher memory access per cycle, you need more banks, more ports, more channels, or higher frequency, or some faster technology that can provide uh, more uh, bits per cycle. right? And as a result, uh, that, is all uh, that, that increases cost as well. So higher bandwidth. Again, if you want to gain, get bandwidth, it's, uh, it's, it's, it costs you. OK, so faster can be obtained with other architectural techniques as well, which we're not going to talk about. But that also makes things more expensive because that increases the, late, uh, that increases the cost uh, of uh, memory access uh, in terms of uh, cost per bit. OK, so if you want to uh, visualize the problem with today's technologies, this may not be the easiest to read. But you can see that bigger is slower. You go from smaller SRAMs to DRAM, uh, let's say phase change memory, flash memory, hard disk. You go from sub nanoseconds to tens of nanoseconds and to hundreds of nanoseconds to microseconds to milliseconds, basically. And if you look at the, uh, so bigger is slower, basically, as you go bigger. And faster is more expensive. You can see these are, this is actually real data from 2021. Uh, uh, and you can see that the SRAM is quite costly per megabyte, $0.3, whereas hard disk is $0.00003 per megabyte. So you can see the cost differential over here as well. And other memory technologies that are not depicted over here uh, have their place as well. And this may be an easier uh, to read version of that problem. This basically shows the problem in a table view uh, going from uh, uh, faster uh, technologies, SRAM, all the way to hard disk. And latencies, you can see the latencies. You can see the capacity uh, and latencies. And you can see the cost per megabyte. And today, we're actually uh, at a very interesting place that the cost per megabyte of memory is very, very low. That's why we can actually put flash memories everywhere uh, today. If you can see it, flash memories cost us not that far from hard disk costs uh, today. And that's, that has enabled a lot of revolution, in my opinion, in mobile systems, for example, that cannot afford hard disks, but they can afford flash memory, solid state memories. And phase change memory is ac actually also getting there, as you can see. It's cheaper than DRAM today, uh, but uh, it, it's not as cheap as flash memory. But uh, going forward, it's going to become cheaper. So it's always instructive to look at these numbers. Uh, so these are 2021 numbers, and the values also scale with time. If you were looking at these numbers in 2031, due to the scaling, technology scaling, these numbers uh, will actually uh, reduce in terms of cost. But the latencies are not reducing as much. It's very interesting to think that, because latency is a lot harder to reduce than cost. Cost is really packing uh, bits in a given millimeter square, right? And that's easier to do as long as you can reduce the size of the memory cells, which is essentially technology scaling or Moore's law. Uh, you can basically put more devices in a given area uh, due to technology scaling. But latency is a very different beast. Uh, so it's very harder to, harder to improve because you're dominated by the interconnect. And interconnects, essentially, the length of the interconnect and the speed of the interconnect does not really scale well uh, with, the, uh, with Moore's law or uh, packing more bits in a millimeter square. You need some other technology to scale the latency. That's why the latencies are not scaling. And to look at it in an instructive fashion, this is actually a slide that I used to use, which uh, it has the data from 2011. So this is, these are data uh, that are 10 years old. And you can see that the cost per megabyte is much higher at that time. 10 years ago, SRAM is $10 per megabyte, whereas today we're $0.3 per megabyte. Hard disk was $1 per gigabyte. Whereas today, uh, we're actually much lower per gigabyte. This is per megabyte, but you can do the conversion uh, over here. Uh, so basically, uh, and, and we have also flash and uh, PCM over here. So basically, a memory hierarchy, uh, a memory cost is becoming much better, but latencies are not becoming much better. And uh, memory hierarchies are actually built to enable a trade-off between latency cost and also other uh, things like bandwidth. OK. So let's just take the latency and cost uh, uh, or capacity. Cost is always equal, equal to capacity uh, as well, because uh, you're really fitting more bits per millimeter square, right? Uh, so uh, let's just take those two aspects. What, uh, and these two aspects motivate the memory hierarchy. Ideally, we want both fast memories and large memories, right? So that we can store a lot of data and have quick access to it. 
But unfortunately, we cannot achieve both with a single level of memory. Otherwise, it'll be magic. And the idea of a memory hierarchy is very simple, basically. You have multiple levels of storage or memory. They get progressively bigger and slower as the levels become farther away from the processor or the compute units. And you manage this hierarchy, these levels, such that you ensure most of the data the processor needs is kept at the faster levels. So whenever the processor needs data, ideally you will get the data from the fast level and you don't need to access the slow levels. Uh, but the slow levels are there so that you can actually have access to large amounts of data. But whenever you're accessing the data, hopefully you get it from the fast levels. That's the idea of a memory hierarchy, basically. You get the best of both worlds, best of low latency memory as well as very high capacity memory. Then the question is, of course, how do you achieve this, basically? Clearly, having multiple levels of storage is easy, but how do you ensure most of the data the processor needs is kept in the faster levels? And that requires a lot of interesting uh, innovations and ideas and algorithms uh, to build caching mechanisms, prefetching mechanisms, uh, and other memory hierarchy management mechanisms that we're going to talk about and introduce in this lecture and the next. But clearly, there are lots, uh, there's a lot of research that has been done in this area for more than 50 years, and we're not going to be able to cover all ideas. But this is essentially what the memory hierarchy looks like. And this is from the reading uh, that I assigned to you today. But basically, you can think of it this way. You have main memory that's large and slow, and you have some caches that are small and fast. And ideally, you don't access main memory. You access caches as much as possible, basically. If you have a good management mechanisms, you, the data that you need goes into the caches before you need it. Okay. But we will see that that ideal is not always possible. So sometimes we access main memory. And when we access main memory, all of the pain of performance uh, comes in uh, because that really stalls the processors. OK, so this is another view of the memory hierarchy. Basically, you want fast and small uh, memories over here. And you have another level, let's say, large but slow memory over here. Uh, you move what you use or what you need to the fast and small memory, and you back up what you don't need in the large but slow memory. And you can see that uh, the fast memory is faster per byte over here. And as you go down the hierarchy, you get cheaper per byte. So with good locality of reference, which we'll talk about locality, and with good management, your memory appears as fast as this fast and small memory, but as large as this, this large but slow memory. So you get the best characteristics of each. You get fast and large, and hopefully you don't get the small and slow but you will get the small and slow if you don't manage the memory hierarchy well. OK, and of course, the idea is extendable. So you can certainly have uh, an next level that's slightly slower but larger, and the next level that's even slower and even larger, uh, but smaller than this uh, large, latest level uh, at the bottom. OK, so this is another view of the memory hierarchy. I, I think I've uh, hammered it home. But the fundamental trade off is fast memory is slow, large memory is slow, and we build a memory hierarchy. And, uh, you can think of register files as part of that memory hierarchy also, and they are actually, except they're managed by the compiler or the programmer. Uh, you put data from the cache into the registers, and the registers work. As we, If you remember, when we introduced the register file in lecture 10, uh, we discussed that register file works because you have locality of reference uh, in values that you manipulate. And uh, you basically store the values that you're going to need very quickly into the register file. And you have a small register file, 32 elements or 16 elements. Uh, GPUs have larger, of course, but 32 elements is uh, reasonable today. And the compiler or the programmer manages this one. Caches are usually automatically managed, and we're going to talk about that. And there are clearly many trade-offs. Latency, for example, increases as you go from left to right. Cost reduces as you go from left to right. So register files are very costly. That's why we have small of them. Size uh, increases as you go from left to right capacity. Bandwidth reduces as you go from left to right. You have very high bandwidth access to register files and then to caches. But your bandwidth to main memory is lower because you have to go off chip. You have to go through off chip interconnects, IO pins. And that's just fundamentally harder to make as high bandwidth as something on chip. Right? On chip, you just add a wire. Right? And wires are not as costly on chip compared to off chip. And as you go even more off chip, the hard disk bandwidth is even lower. So you can actually see how latency costs size and bandwidth uh, scale as you go from left to right in the memory hierarchy over here. And this is from your reading, basically. This is an example memory hierarchy with three levels, L1, L2, L3. We don't show the registers over here. Uh, and you can see some values over here that I'm not going to talk about. 
OK, so why does this work, basically? If you actually design a memory hierarchy like this, and even if you don't manage it uh, very carefully, uh, there is this locality of reference that happens in uh, programs uh, that enables uh, a fast memory. So if you actually take uh, whatever you accessed from the slow memory and keep it in the fast memory for some time, it's likely that you're going to access it again. And this is because of the locality of reference. And this is because if you recently used a value, you're going to reuse it again. And programs exhibit this locality of reference. So even if you don't manage the memory extremely carefully, this memory hierarchy is helpful. Of course, maybe a complicated memory hierarchy is not very helpful if you don't manage it carefully. But a simple memory hierarchy actually is relatively helpful. And locality is actually a general property. It's really a property of potentially life, right? Uh, one's recent past is a very good predictor of his or her or their near future, actually. Temporal locality, for example, uh, is the general concept of if you just did something, it's very likely that you will do the same thing again soon. It doesn't apply in all circumstances, but it applies in some circumstances. For example, since you're attending uh, the lecture today, there's a good chance you will be here again and again regularly. And that's uh, temporal locality. Spatial locality is, uh, essentially locality also happens in time and space. And spatial locality is a space version of the temporal locality. Basically, it means it says that if you did something, it's very likely that you will do something similar or related in space. And for example, I mean, if you were having a, a, a real lecture where people were actually sitting in a classroom, which we will hopefully get to uh, next semester, unfortunately, you're missing out on that. And that's not very uh, ideal this semester. But uh, and we're also missing out on some of the interaction because of that, unfortunately. Uh, but basically, uh, the spatial locality principle uh, always held when I was giving uh, real lectures. Every, every time I find uh, someone in the room, they're probably sitting close to the same people for whatever reason, right? Maybe they're friends. Maybe they just like uh, that particular location to sit in the classroom. Essentially, they're spatially correlated with each other. And uh, this is the notion of spatial locality. And we're going to see that in uh, the program's access patterns also. But these are, in my opinion, the more general principles uh, that can be applied to different things in life also. And you will see that this lecture actually is like that uh, as well. OK, so memory locality, locality in the uh, case of memory references, uh, refers to the fact that a typical program has a lot of locality in its references. Uh, and basically, it's a temporal and spatial locality. So I'm going to narrow down this temporal and loca uh, spatial locality definitions to uh, the memory system and programs in a little bit. And one of the reasons is typical programs are composed of loops, but that's not just the only reason. Uh, loops uh, tend to iterate, and they tend to access different uh, uh, data, uh, as you have seen earlier. But temporal locality says that a program tends to reference the same memory location many times, and all within a small window of time. And this is why registers help, right? You basically allocate a value in a register and reuse it many times, right? Caches also help because of that, as we will see. Spatial locality says a program tends to reference nearby memory locations, nearby in the memory address space, within a window of time. So both of them have a notion of time, but uh, certainly temporal is just about time. Spatial is about uh, memory locations that are close by each other within uh, a memory region, let's say. So uh, temporal locality, you can uh, guess why. You, you basically load a variable. Uh, you're adding it to uh, 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 some, some other variable. And, but you may also be adding it to some other variable, right? Basically, uh, if, you, if, you have, if you load variable A, you may be adding it to 20 different things. Uh, and as a result, A has very good temporal locality. That makes sense. Spatial locality is also intuitive, basically. Uh, why do you reference, why does a program reference nearby memory locations within a window of time? Well, most notably, we've seen actually these two things. Instruction memory references, right? Whenever we're uh, fetching instructions, we're going sequentially. Uh, in the memory address space. We're fetching uh, the instruction at PC, program counter, and then program counter plus four, and then program counter plus eight. So every time we're incrementing program counter by four, which means that we're going sequentially in memory, which means that we have good spatial locality. We're accessing nearby memory locations as we go uh, forward in the instruction stream. So this, this is broken only when we change the control flow. All right. But even when we change the control flow, if the branch is branch is branch is if the target address of a branch is to a nearby memory location, then you still have spatial locality basically. 
Okay, so that's an example of why spatial locality exists because of instruction memory references. But we've also seen why spatial locality exists when we talked about SIMD uh, processors and GPUs, right? We talked about references to arrays and vectors. And these are often streaming and strided. Remember the example where we talked about element-wise averaging of the arrays or the addition of arrays or matrix multiplication. Basically, what you're doing is you're streaming through rows uh, and columns in that case. And the references to arrays and vec uh, vectors are uh, usually streaming or strided. You almost always reference the next location, which is the stride of one. That's what streaming means, actually, in this particular case. Or you may have a stride of two, three, four, five, ten, a small stride. Uh, basically, that enables you to have a spatial locality uh, because now you're accessing something close by in memory to what you've accessed before. So clearly, uh, many examples exist uh, to support this. And that's why the memory hierarchy, as we described it, works, because it can exploit both of these types of localities, both temporal and spatial localities. And we're going to talk about that base, how to exploit both. Caches exploit both. Uh, if you want to exploit temporal locality, what you need to do is, whenever you bring some data elements from main memory, you put it into a fast memory, let's say it's called a cache, and you just keep it there. right? And if it has temporal locality, you will access it from that fast memory. If you want to exploit spatial locality, whenever you need to access one element, let's say A, uh, memory location A in memory, you access memory location A, you, don't, you bring it into uh, the uh, cache or fast uh, memory, but you don't only bring that. You bring some nearby data in nearby memory locations as well in the anticipation that you will have some sort of spatial locality. And that's enabled. So you basically build, uh, bring a bigger block of memory bigger region of memory into your fast cache or fast storage. As a result, you can exploit spatial locality. And if the program needs uh, address A plus one, for example, you've already brought it into the cache when you brought address A. OK, so uh, for, for uh, existing systems exploit both of these, and we will see that. OK, so and I've already, I've already mentioned this, but I'm going to go, uh, go through this again a little bit more formally. So caches exploit uh, temporal locality. And the key idea is to store recently accessed data in automatically managed fast memory. And automatically managed fast memory is called a cache today. Uh, we're going to talk about manual management also. Uh, there are manually managed memories as well. And we're going to get back to that. But mo modern caches actually are automatically managed. And uh, cache, the meaning of cache has been uh, very strongly associated with this automatic management. Uh, if you manually manage uh, a fast memory, it's usually called a scratch pad memory or another memory level, basically. Uh, so when, it, when, when you hear the word cache, uh, you should really think automatic management uh, today. Uh, okay, uh, so there's one question. Is this prediction for memory similar to branch prediction? Can you use some ideas from branch prediction here? Potentially, yes. Uh, so if you want to optimize, yes, potentially. Basically, if you want to decide what to cache and what not to cache, you can potentially keep some history, for example, and decide oh, I didn't reuse this region before, so I'm not going to cache it. Certainly, yes. Certainly, you can uh, have more advanced ideas uh, to uh, do the management uh, more intelligently. Absolutely. So basically, you can do history-based management in caches. But I'm not, I'm not even talking about that at this point. I'm talking about basically saying, whenever you access some data, bring it into this automatically managed fetch memory. You don't even uh, do it intelligently. You do it every time. But of course, if you're not going to reuse the data, this may be a bad idea, and you can uh, you can improve on this idea by adding prediction mechanisms that decide uh, or that guess which data is going to be needed in the future and keep them inside uh, this fast memory. And we're going to talk about that when we uh, get more advanced, basically. Very good question. OK, so this is the temporal locality aspect. Basically, anticipation is that same memory location will be accessed again soon by the program or by some other thread that are, that's going to access the cache. So think about it as well. So it may, it may be accessed by this thread uh, or by some other thread or by some other program also potentially. So that's the temporal locality principle, basically. Recently accessed data will be accessed again in the near future. And if the data obeys this principle, then that's great. Caches work. And this is what Morris Wilkes had in mind in the seminal paper uh, that I assigned you as uh, reading. Uh, that's two pages, by the way, only one and a half pages, actually. And uh, he says over here, the users discuss of a fast core memory of, say, 32,000 words, that's old times, as a slave to a slower core memory of, say, 1 million words, again, old times, in such a way that in practical cases, the effective access time is nearer that of the fast memory than that of the slow memory. 
And this is a beautiful depiction of where the cache is, basically. Okay, so let's talk about spatial locality also. Spatial locality, the idea in exploiting spatial locality in a cache is we would like to store the data in addresses, memory addresses, adjacent to the recently accessed one in automatically managed fast memory called a cache. So we don't just access, we don't just store the recently accessed location, but we also store the data and addresses that are adjacent to that location. So we store a block, let's say, this is called a cache block or cache line as we will see. So to be able to do this, you need to logically divide memory into equal. There are many actually, there are many ways of doing this, but in hardware caches, you logically divide memory into equal size blocks because hardware management is easier if you have equal size blocks. Uh, and fetch to cache the access block in its entirety completely as we will discuss. Uh, and the anticipation is that this nearby memory locations within the block will be accessed soon. Not just the recently accessed data word, but everything within the block. Okay, and this is the spatial locality principle, nearby data. And the anticipation is that nearby data in memory will be accessed in the near future. And we also discussed why this may happen in real programs. And this is what uh, one of the earliest processors that implemented cache implemented, IBM 3685. IBM 360 is an architecture it's a mainframe architecture that has been extremely successful. It's actually one of the oldest uh, architectures. In fact, IBM 360 is the first system that really used the, an 8-bit byte, for example. Uh, the reason why we have bytes, the notion of bytes, is IBM 360 actually used it. it. They went from 6 bits to 8 bits, and it's, it's, it worked for the rest of the remaining, I guess, 50 plus years right now. But they also implement the cache. And they had a 16 kilobyte cache with 64 byte blocks. And there's a beautiful paper that talks about how this works. Amazingly, today, uh, L1 caches are not so dissimilarly sized, basically. Block, si block sizes are similar. Uh, cache sizes are maybe a little bit larger. Uh, but uh, 64 byte blocks are quite common today. And there's a reason for it. L1 caches are very tightly integrated with the processor, processing core. So the requirements of an L1 cache are usually dictated by the processing core, as we will see. But L2, L3, L4, other caches can be much bigger, and they can have different size blocks also, as we will uh, also see. But spatial locality principle is also uh, what uh, we discussed. OK, so I have an analogy for uh, this uh, uh, very quickly. Uh, basically, uh, if you're studying, you may have books, right? And uh, your, book, uh, uh, your books actually uh, may form a hierarchy. Uh, as well. Maybe you can call it a book hierarchy, right? Uh, you may have a book in your hand. That's the thing that you're processing at this point. That's the data that you're processing at this point. So it has to be in your register file, which may be your hand. Uh, you may have some books on your desk, and maybe those are recently used books. They tend to stay on your desk. Uh, these are the books uh, maybe for classes you're taking, uh, maybe computer architecture books, and maybe uh, things that, are, that you have recently used and that you anticipate to use. Uh, but of course, they stay on your desk until the desk gets full. Once the desk get, gets full, you may need to evict the book from the desk, which may, be a, which may like, look like a cache, right? And you evict the book and you, send it to the, you put it to the bookshelf. And in the bookshelf, you may organize your books some, some way. Once your bookshelf gets full, uh, maybe you put some really, really unnecessary or, uh, or not so used books to boxes uh, at home. And you may also have boxes in storage, not at home, right? That's, uh, uh, that store books that you really don't anticipate using, right? Uh, so this, is, this looks like a memory hierarchy to me, basically. The data that you anticipate to use are actually closer to you. Uh, but whatever you have closer to you have li has limited space. Your hands clearly can hold, if you're lucky, maybe three books, right? <laughs> but usually one book or so. Uh, your desk, depending on the size of your desk, but it's usually small. It may not hold a lot of books. Your bookshelf uh, may, may hold... Uh, a lot, uh, more books and then boxes and bo uh, storage can be essentially unlimited as long as you're willing to pay for it, right? But uh, this is the temporal locality principle, right? Basically, uh, recently used or frequently used things, you try to at least keep closer to you and not long latency access in storage, for example. But also there's a spatial locality aspect of it as well. So for example, uh, you may actually organize your books based on some content in your bookshelf and if you do that, physically adjacent books in the space may be needed around the same time. And this is the, exactly the spatial locality principle in caches uh, that we have discussed earlier in programs. If you have organized your data nicely, you may actually need the books that are spatially correlated, that are closely 
uh, located in your bookshelf at the same time. That's, that also holds for your cache in your desk, for example. If you put things nicely, you may actually get things, um, you may actually need uh, 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 multiple books uh, uh, at the same time, and they happen to be in the same place, uh, in the same region. But if you actually randomly distribute your books onto your bookshelf, you may actually have no spatial locality, right? Because you may need a book, a computer architecture book, let's say, and let's say you have 10 computer architecture books, and they're all uh, randomly distributed in your bookshelf, and you have no spatial locality, essentially, so you have to access different locations. So you cannot exploit spatial locality. You can exploit spatial locality only if you co-locate your data that you're going to access together. And that's true for programs also. And we discussed this when we talk about GPUs, for example. If you really want to get good performance, you want good spatial locality in your GPUs, right? OK, uh, there's one more question. If some memory from the large, slow memory is called, does it first go through all the smaller memories and then to the processor, or does it go there directly? So that's a very good question also. That depends on how you manage the memory hierarchy. Usually, in a traditional system, it may go through, it may be actually uh, put in all of the uh, caches, but you may actually decide to bypass some of the caches also. So uh, existing systems actually enable uh, bypassing of the caches. And in, in hardware, there are a lot of prop proposals to actually do the management in a uh, in an intelligent way. But those are, all, those are all design choices in the memory hierarchy. That's why memory hierarchy is very rich in terms of design choices. OK, so caching in a pipeline design. I mentioned this earlier, but the cache needs to be tightly integrated into the pipeline, actually. Ideally, you want access in one cycle so that load-dependent operations do not stall. So level one cache is very tightly integrated. So, but in a high-frequency pipeline, you cannot make the cache large, basically. Uh, but you want a large cache and a pipeline design at the same time. And this is one reason why you have a level one cache that's tightly integrated into the pipeline. And you have a cache hierarchy after that. Level two cache, level three cache, level four cache. In this case, we show only level two. But keep this in mind. Level one caches are always very tightly integrated into the pipeline uh, because, they're, because the processor needs to supply data to the load as soon as possible. One cycle, maybe two cycles, maybe three cycles, maybe four cycles. But you don't want to extend that time much longer because the latency uh, uh, is not easy to tolerate. And we discussed a lot of latency tolerance mechanisms so far. So if it's 100 cycles, that's bad, basically. That's why we have a cache hierarchy today. And level one cache design decisions are mainly dictated by here. Level two cache design decisions are actually much more free, if you will. And level three cache is much more free, clearly, because they're, they're not tightly integrated into the pipeline. OK, let's talk about manual and automatic management. As I mentioned, this is going to be uh, important. So who manages the data movement across these levels? You have a fast memory. Clearly, register files, we talked about programmer or compiler manages. Potentially, you can imagine systems where hardware manages it also. But then how do you actually uh, reconcile the programming uh, of registers and the hardware management? That's a different issue we're not going to talk about. But the register files, we can take it for granted that programmer manages. But what about cache levels? Uh, manual means programmer manages data movement across different levels. Automatic means hardware manages data movement across levels transparently to the program. And this is another great example of the programmer microarchitect trade-off. So manual makes it hard on the programmer, of course, right? Too painful for programmers on substantial programs, unfortunately. Uh, but it used to be the case, basically. In general purpose systems, you had core versus drum memory in the 1950s, all the way into 1970s. And uh, essentially, the programmers managed multiple levels of memories. Today, there are actually some systems that have uh, cache. Uh, I don't want to call them caches necessarily, but this, these are scratch pad memories. Uh, that the programmer can manage. Programmer decides to put, uh, uh, they have full control on the memory structure, and they basically decide what to put into this past memory structure. It's called scratch pad in general. Uh, and embedded processors have it, because in embedded processors, programs are usually simple. Programmers know what they're doing, and they want to get predictable performance, so uh, they usually avoid the caches. GPUs have scratch pad memories, as we've briefly discussed, I'm going to show you some pictures. They're called shared memory, unfortunately, in the GPU terminology. And not a good terminology. It's better to call it scratch pad memory. Uh, shared memory means something else. It's shared between different processors, for example. Unfortunately, uh, this, uh, some companies decided to call it shared memory, but bad idea. Uh, it's shared across different threads, sure, but uh, it's really a scratch pad. Uh, that's what distinguishes it. Uh, so uh, some machine learning accelerators also have scratch pad memories today, increasingly, because, again, programs are relatively simple. You can actually manage the memory hierarchy potentially better than what hardware could do. 
But GPUs also have caches today that are automatically managed. I'm going to show you examples of this. Automatic management, hardware manages the data moment, as we said, transparent to the programmer. So the big advantage is programmer's life is a lot easier. So with complicated programs, the programmer doesn't need to deal with it. And the average programmer doesn't need to know about caches. You don't need to know about how big the cache is, what, is, what its parameters are, how it works to write a correct program. But if you want a fast program, maybe you do need to know some of those properties and you do need to arrange your data so that it fits into your caches, for example. And we're going to get back to that. We're going to talk about software management of caches later in this lecture. So correct program, no problem. You can write it uh, and take advantage of the caches. But if you want the maximum performance, even in an automatically managed memory hierarchy, you still uh, may want to uh, optimize your program and data uh, so that you can exploit the memory hierarchy much better. So let me give you some examples. So this is actually a GPU, a very recent GPU, NVIDIA Ampere. And they implement both caches and scratch pads at the same time, essentially. So L1 cache, for example, uh, well, uh, L1 level uh, has 192 kilobytes of memory per streaming multiprocessor. It can be used as L1 cache and or scratch pad, depending on what the programmer chooses. And the programmer can choose this on a per kernel basis. So the programmer can decide whether hardware manages it or they manage it. That's nice, basically. There's an option. Nice in the sense that expert programmers can decide what they need to do. But the average programmers can also say, OK, I don't want to deal with it. Let it be managed in hardware as a cache. right? So that makes program built easier, while also giving an interface to the expert programmers so that expert programmers can take advantage of this memory in the way they believe uh, is the best way to take advantage of. But again, programmers may be wrong sometimes as well. Right? So L2 cache, on the other end, is huge, as you can see, 40 megabytes. And that's automatically managed. That's why it's called a cache. OK, this is Cerebrus's wafer scale engine. We mentioned this many times, right? I mentioned it in the last lecture also. It has a huge amount of on-chip memory, SRAM memory. And it turns out that SRAM memory is used as a scratch pad memory. So basically, this is the whole wafer scale engine. You can see that there are 84 dies. And each die has a single die has 4,500 or some tiles. And each tile has a scratch pad memory and an accelerator block over here for machine learning. And that scratch pad memory is managed by the programmer or the compiler, essentially. And it's 48 kilobytes, as you can see. So you basically program uh, this entire accelerator tile by tile and then communicate between tiles. But each tile has a scratch pad memory that's manually managed, as you can see, which is interesting. And the total amount of manually managed uh, scratch pad memory is 18 gigabytes on the full chip. And there is no shared memory according to uh, Cerebras. And you can see that this number became much larger in the recent generation to 40 gigabytes. OK, so uh, that's the distinction between automatic versus, uh, 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 automatic versus manual management. And there are clear trade-offs associated with it. Right. So let's talk about caches. So caches are actually automatically managed. And I'm going to assume that in this lecture and future lectures. Whenever we talk about manually managed, it's called scratch pad memory. And automatic management was what Morris Wilkes had in mind. I already read you the summary, and this is the paper. But basically, uh, he says, by, by slave memory, slave memory is a cache memory in this particular case. I mean one which automatically accumulates to itself words that come from a slower main memory and keeps them available for subsequent use without it being necessary for the penalty of main memory access to be incurred again. So it's beautifully stated this way, basically, as you can see. And in this particular case, uh, the cache that was proposed by Morris Wilkes, well, it was obviously automatically managed, but also, it was also a temporal locality cache. It didn't exploit spatial locality, which is interesting. OK, there is a historical aside. I'll go through this relatively quickly. But it turns out Morris Wilkes' paper is not the first paper on caches. There are earlier papers like these two. Uh, the first one is more of a, a larger virtual memory-based system that talks about automatic management of disks and uh, other memories. But the second one is very interesting because it's a real hardware cache that was proposed in the design of some processors. And you can see, we're going to look at pictures that kind of look like this, basically. They called it a Lucasite system. So this is main memory for them. You can see that there's an address register and data register. And this is a cache for them. Basically, this is the tag store, as we will see soon. And this is a data store. And you look up the tag store to, the processor looks up the tag store to figure out whether the data is in the cache or not. If, not, if it's not in the cache, then you go to the main memory. If it is in the cache, you get the data from the data storage. So we're going to take a look at that uh, soon. But essentially, a cache looks like what it looks like in 1962 today, except the management algorithms may be very different. 
So a modern memory hierarchy looks like this. Basically, I'm not going to go through this in uh, a lot of detail, but register files are part of the memory hierarchy, as I said. They're manually managed, compiler or programmer managed. And you do the spilling to the main memory. And the main memory, there's automatic hardware cache management in these levels. And there's clearly main memory that the programmer has is exposure to. And then there's another automatic level of management for swap disk, which we will talk about in the virtual memory lectures. What if you run out of main memory, basically? Uh, then you actually swap the data to a larger disk. And this is also automatically managed today. In the past, this used to be manually managed. And that was too painful for the programmers. As a result, uh, virtual memory was invented and demand paging was invented. And as a result, this part is also automatically managed. But keep in mind that there's this part of the memory hierarchy as well, register files. And there's a swap disk, which we will talk about in the next lectures. But in this uh, set of lectures, we're going to focus on the caches. OK, uh, before we take a break, let me quickly talk about hierarchical latency analysis. And then we're going to go deeper into the caches. So if you look at a memory system that looks like this, clearly uh, it has many levels. And this is uh, very much representative of an existing system. Maybe the numbers are different in different systems, clearly. Uh, but basically. You can do a hierarchical latency analysis. And this is also in your reading, so I'm going to go through it relatively quickly. But basically, a given memory hierarchy level, I, has a technology interesting access time, or latency. Let's call it small ti. But you have also a perceived access time, large ti, that's longer than small ti, because you may actually not find the data at a given memory hierarchy level i, right? Because it's caching. So basically, uh, except for the outermost hierarchy, which is really the swap disk in this case, or main memory if you ignore the swap disk, uh, there's a chance whenever you query a particular uh, memory structure or cache structure, there's a chance you're going to hit, and there's a chance you're going to miss. Right? So the probability that you're going to hit is called a hit rate. Uh, you hit in the cache, which means that you find the data in the cache. And the access time is called TI, small TI. That's the intrinsic access time. But if you miss, then that's, that probability is called MI. And the access time now, it becomes TI to figure out whether you hit or miss, a little small TI, plus the, uh, the, uh, the perceived access time of the outermost, uh, the, the outer level, the next level in the hierarchy. So basically, you can do a hierarchical latency analysis with this equation, basically. If you hit, you get the TI latency. If you miss, you get the TI, small TI plus large TI plus one latency, which is the access latency of the outer structures. So if I go back over here, so. If I hit in the L1 cache, I have a small TI latency, nanoseconds. But if I miss, then the latency that I see for all of those misses is the outer uh, L2 caches, essentially large TI, which makes sense hopefully. But of course, uh, there are some invariants, which is hit rate plus miss rate at a given level should be equal to 1. You either hit or miss. That makes sense hopefully. And you can determine the latency uh, or the perceived access time of the level by multiplying the hit rate with the intrinsic access time of the level and, and adding to it the miss rate multiplied by the intrinsic access time of the level plus the perceived access time of the next level. In other words, you can actually simplify it by saying, for hits or misses, it doesn't matter. You have to access the cache to figure out whether you hit or miss. That's what TI means, small TI means, technology intrinsic TI means that at that level's access time. Plus, for misses, you pay the penalty of the next level's perceived access time. Make sense? So basically, you can, uh, you can, you can basically uh, put values into this hierarchical equation, which I'm going to do uh, before I take a break, uh, to show you uh, what it looks like, essentially. OK, so uh, I, I've already mentioned this, basically. Hits, uh, HI and MI at the level are defined to be hit rate and miss rate of just the references that missed at level I plus 1, I minus 1. So basically, these are the references that are seen by a given level, i. OK. So this is the recursive latency equation, then. Uh, the perceived access time of a level, i, is equal to the intrinsic access time of that level, i, plus the miss rate at that level, i, times the perceived access time of the next level in the hierarchy. So if i is 1, that's L1, uh, this large t, i plus 1, is L2's perceived access time over here. OK, so what do you want, ideally? The goal, you want to achieve desired T1, level 1 latency, within allowed cost. T1 is level 1, basically. Uh, that's the closest you can get, because we're not talking about registers. Ideally, you want to minimize that, and you have something desirable. So ideally, you want to make 
uh, the perceived access latency very similar to the intrinsic access latency by minimizing the second part of the equation. But this is not always possible, clearly, right? How do you make it possible? You try to keep the miss rate from a given level low, or you try to give the, uh, keep the perceived access latency of the next level low. And these are both things that you can optimize potentially in the program or in hardware. And we're going to see that. This is actually fascinating, I think. think fascinating to think about it more formally like this. So if you want to keep uh, the miss rate of a level low, you can increase the capacity, right? That's obvious. It lowers MI, but it may increase your intrinsic access latency at that level. So increasing capacity may lower your miss rate. Not always, sometimes. In general, it does. But it also increases your uh, intrinsic access latency. But you could also lower miss rate by smarter cache management that we briefly discussed based on a question from one of your colleagues, right? So you can basically be careful about what you place into the cache. Uh, you can be careful about what you replace from the cache. You can anticipate what you do need, what you don't need. And you can prefetch into the cache such that you minimize the miss misses whenever the processor needs it. Alternatively, or maybe uh, to together with keeping the miss rate low, you can try to keep the perceived access latency of the next level low. And how do you do that? You may make the faster, uh, lower hierarchies, or L2 caches, L3 caches, faster, but then your cost may increase. Because why? how do you keep it faster? You may increase your capacities, for example, or you may actually reduce the capacities depending on what you're trying to optimize exactly. So this may increase the cost. Or you can introduce intermediate hierarchies as a compromise, but that may also increase the cost. So basically, this is a, this not an easy optimization problem, as you can see, because it's, it's, it, it may add a lot of levels. It also is very much workload dependent, program dependent. OK, let me give you a quick example of this latency equation, and then we're going to take a break. But basically, let's, let's, uh, let's put real values over here in this equation. Uh, and I'm going to use Pentium 4 as an example. And remember, we saw a picture of Pentium 4 in the past. This is the Prescott version, 90 nanometer version. And you can see that L1 data cache is 16 kilobytes, L2 cache is 1 megabyte. And ignore the eight way, we're going to talk about associativity. There's an instruction cache called the trace cache, which we're, not, we're also going to ignore. But Intel Pentium 4 is real, and it has a huge L2 cache. I think this is the 2 megabyte version. But again, this is uh, circa 2004 or so, or 2005 maybe. Uh, but you can see that the L2 cache is occupying a lot of space over here. But these are the values in Pentium 4, at least one version of Pentium 4. Basically, the capacity of L1 cache is 16 kilobytes. Intrinsic access time is four cycles for integers. Ignore the floating point, because floating point requires wider values, so they require longer cycles. L2 data cache capacity is one megabyte in this particular processor, and the access time is 18 cycles. Very interesting, right? Main memory, we're going to assume that the access time, intrinsic access time, is 50 nanoseconds, or 180 cycles. And this is very optimistic, by the way. Usually, main memories are much longer. So notice that best gate latency is not one, it's four. The intrinsic access time of L1 cache is four, basically. Very interesting, right? And worst case access latencies can be up to 500 plus cycles, uh, which we're gonna, we're gonna talk about. But let's take a look at this equation. If M1 is equal to 0 0.1 and M2 is equal to 0 0.1, if you plug these values uh, into the equation that I showed you over here, which I should have copied perhaps, what you get is T1 is equal to 7.6 and T2 is equal to 36. So how do you do this? Basically, you do this by uh, looking at the outermost first. So for the outermost, uh, larger T2 is equal to intrinsic access time of the L2 cache, 18, plus the miss rate from T2, 0 0.1, times 180, which is uh, the perceived access time of main memory, which is uh, equal to intrinsic access time of main memory because we don't have any other level. So basically, it's 18 plus 0 0.1 times 180, which is 18 plus 18, 36. So perceived access time of the second level is 36 cycles. And you put this value into the L1 cache equation, which is four cycles, T1, plus miss rate from L1, which is 0 0.1 times T2, right? And that actually gets you four plus uh, 0 0.1 times 36, which is 7.6. So perceived access time at the L1 level is 7.6 cycles, which is a lot. And this is your cache are actually working not so bad. Your miss rate from the first level is 10%. Uh, Only 10% of the accesses miss in the L1 cache. Only 10% of the accesses that go to the L2 cache miss in the L2 cache. Even then, you get 7.6 cycle latency in the L1 cache. That's a lot. Now, let's take a look at something else. If your miss rate is 1% only in each level, now you get much closer to the intrinsic access latency 
of the level one cash, 4.2 cycles. That looks much better, right? But you need to get a 99% hit rate in the L1 cash and 99% hit rate in the L2 cash. May not be easy. Okay, now let's look some, at something else. This is your miss rate at the L1 cash is 5%, which is 95% hit rate. 95% of the references uh, that you go into L1 cash hit. Uh, now this goes to five quickly. So a small increase in miss rate in the L1 cash level leads to a very, very large increase, I would say, in the uh, access latency, perceived access latency of level one. Now let's take a look at this. Uh, going from here to here, if you take, if you keep the same miss rate in L1 cash, 0.01, but increase the miss rate in the L2 cash by 50x to 0.5, we get 5.08, which is very similar to over here. So here, going from here, uh, the, the second part over here to third part, we increase the miss rate in L1 cash by 5x. Here, going from second part to fourth part over here, we increase the miss rate in the L2 cash by 50x while keeping the other constant. And we get similar amount of latency, perceived access latency in the L1 cash. So this shows you that you can actually get similar latencies by managing the caches in different ways. And uh, Depends on how you uh, get. So this, uh, this, uh, the second one may be more realistic, depending on your locality of reference. So a miss rate in the L2 cache uh, can be 50%, because L2 cache actually sees references that do not uh, get satisfied by the L1 cache, right? You access L1 cache first, and then if you miss, then you access L2 cache. Uh, so basically, you can see that the optimization problem is actually very interesting. You can get a similar access latency by either uh, giving up a little bit on your L1 cache or giving up a lot on your L2 cache in terms of the miss rate. And that's why this optimization problem is actually not easy. And uh, I will let you think about this uh, a little bit. OK, there's one question. So T3 is large T3 is small T3 here because it's assumed that main memory never misses absolute BS. Here, we're assuming main memory never misses. As I mentioned earlier, we don't assume there's a swap disk because that complicates the equations uh, even more. But the equations, the real equation is, of course, more complicated. OK. So this is a great place to take a break. So let's take a 10 minute break over here. Uh, very, uh, and then we're going to talk about cache basics and operation. And then we're going to advance uh, on cache basics and operation. Uh, so let's take a break uh, until 15, 23, and then we will continue this. OK, I think it's time to start. Uh, but I will start with taking a couple of questions uh, that were put over here during the break. So one, uh, uh, there's a question that says, if the cache is used an exclusive policy, the missed probability of L2 would be lower, though. No, um, not clear. So basically, uh, there is a, uh, clearly, you can manage the caches in different ways. Uh, exclusive policy means that uh, one uh, data that's present in one cache is not present in other caches, right? Uh, we, we will talk about it later on when we talk about more advanced caches. So you have a choice as to where the data is in the hierarchy, a given block is in this hierarchy when you manage the caches. And you may actually have an inclusive policy or exclusive policy, and they have their advanced and disadvantages. But the hit rate, miss rate depends on uh, the access patterns. But if you use an exclusive policy, yes, then you actually have more overall space because you're not uh, redundantly using the space for the same block across different levels. But uh, now you need to manage. You need to have management overhead in terms of your caches also in hardware. So it really depends. Uh, but that's a very good point, basically. You may, you may have more space if you have an exclusive policy. And there's one more question, which is also interesting, but more research related. Basically, uh, one of you asks uh, uh, that PCM can also be used as SSD, but it can also be used as memory. Could this mean that potentially one day there is no distinction between main memory and storage anymore? Absolutely, potentially, right? Uh, it's, if you have a memory technology, uh, that's close enough, uh, that's good enough as both memory and storage. And you, then you may actually use it both for main memory and storage. And uh, there's a reason why these memory technologies are also called storage class memories. You can use them as both main memory and storage memory. And there's a lot of research actually going on on how to enable both uh, these technologies as both memory and storage. In fact, my group has written some papers on that topic also. Uh, there's a paper that we wrote for the workshop on energy efficient design in 2013 that essentially talks about a case for hardware software cooperative management of uh, storage and memory that essentially says the same thing. We want to unify the management of storage and memory. But of course, today that's not done. Uh, and there's, there's some challenge, system level challenges to enable it as well. Uh, so there's more to do to enable something like this. But technologies like phase change memory can be catalysts uh, for those uh, type of new ideas 
uh, or old ideas maybe that uh, have a new space uh, in computing again, uh, then uh, uh, yeah, they can be catalysts that can enable uh, more research as well as future products. But that's a very good point. That's beyond the uh, beyond this course at this point, of course. Okay. Now let's go back uh, to what we were talking about. So now I'm going to more formally introduce a hardware cache. Uh, and we're going to talk about its basics and operation. And then we're going to build up onto management policies. And caching is a very broad idea, actually. Everything we discussed so far can be applied to software as well. Because in software, you have a locality of reference. And you can actually build software data structures that act as your caches. In distributed systems, you can have software caches when you actually program across many machines in a data center. You may have local memory or far memory, or you may have actually local storage and far storage. And you can decide you build a software-based cache in your local storage or local memory, right? So all of these ideas that we have discussed so far are actually very broad reaching in systems in general. So we're going to focus more on the hardware caches soon. So before we focus on uh, hardware caches, a cache is essentially any structure that memorizes frequently or recently used results or data. And this is very general. Again, it could be software. It could be hardware. And the goal is to avoid repeating the long latency operations required to reproduce or fetch. That should be fetched. I'm going to correct it. Uh, fetch the results and data from scratch. For example, a web cache. Uh, in fact, uh, whenever you're browsing, your browser may be caching the pages that you recently visited so that the next time you want to visit that same page, uh, it loads directly from your main memory where it's cached uh, that page at, as opposed to going over the network and fetching the page again, especially if the page uh, is known to not change uh, so that uh, it, this works right. And sometimes the page changes and you get a different result in your cache versus when you force your browser to reload uh, the page uh, from the network. But essentially, this, this idea of a cache is used by uh, many, many software constructs as well, applications as well, as you can uh, see. Uh, and similar design decisions also appear uh, in these caches, like the size, what should be the size of the cache, what should be put in there, what should not be put in there. You can also, pre do, what kind of prefetching do you do into the cache? Can you preload? So for example, when you, uh, when you are visiting a web page, your browser may be aggressively prefetching the links on that web page based on some information. Like without any information, we actually be going and prefetching the links, right? And loading, preloading them into this web cache. And if you actually click on that link, then the data, then the web page that you want to see is already uh, in your local machine, basically, because it's prefetched. So clearly, this reduces the latency and increases the hit rate of your web cache. But this is one uh, way you can prefetch, basically. The prefetch means preloading. Uh, and clearly, it works well with uh, this sort of environment. But of course, if you're not going to reuse the data that uh, the uh, browser preloaded, then you waste some bandwidth uh, to get that data. So you can have intelligent algorithms to decide that preloading. Right? The browser can say, oh, I'm going to guess that uh, the user is going to click on these links, so I'm going to prefetch them. I'm going to guess that this web page that the user has visited, is not, uh, they're not going to reuse it again, so I'm not going to cache it. So similar decisions exist, except software caches tend to be much more flexible in the sense that uh, the block size, because you don't, you're not limited by what you can do in hardware uh, or what you can do in hardware efficiently. Your block sizes can be variable, for example. You may decide to cache eight bytes at a time or one megabyte at a time or maybe one gigabyte at a time, right? That's a lot, but you may decide that it's a good idea to do that caching. So you're not limited to a fixed block size, as we will see hardware will be limited to for efficient querying of the cache. So think about these when you think about caches. They're software. They're, 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 clearly, the ideas that we're going to discuss are going to be applicable to many things in systems and software as well. But we're going to look at a particular case of a hardware cache. And most commonly in the processor design context, this is an automatically managed memory structure. And it's usually SRAM. For example, we want to memorize in fast SRAM the most frequently or recently accessed DM memory locations to avoid repeatedly paying the penalty for the DM access latency. Right? And even in this sentence, uh, I don't quite tell you exactly what's cached. Right? I say most frequently or most recently accessed. These are two different things, actually. How do you determine what's most frequently accessed? That becomes a question now. right? How do you determine what's most recently accessed? That's also a question, although you, that's easier question. So this is a conceptual picture of a cache from the reading that I assigned to you. Essentially, cache has a limited size of storage that can store some number of cache blocks. And cache block uh, 
essentially, you need two different types of information. One is the data in the block. It could be 64 bytes. I'm going to show you a toy cache soon that's not going to be 64 bytes. But in the most modern systems, you get 64 byte blocks. In some IBM systems, actually, the block sizes are much larger because they found out that for their server workloads, larger block sizes are a good idea, like 256 bytes. So you need to have storage of the data of the memory address associated with the data. And you need to have information about the cache block, like the address. That's called a tag in hardware caches, at least. So you need to have, you need to have two different types of information, tag and data. Data is clearly the data at that address, at the, of that block at that address. Tag is the address information and maybe some other metadata. For example, valid. Is this cache block is valid? Meaning, uh, is there something in this location in the cache that I brought from memory? That's the purpose of a valid bit. It has to be in the tag store because you don't want to access the cache and get some random data that you didn't bring in, right? So you need to uh, understand whether what you have in the cache is valid or not. You may actually have other bits, as we will discuss, like a dirty bit or modified bit. Is this cache block modified by the processor? That indicates that this cache block was modified. Maybe you need to write it back to memory when you're evicting the cache block. You may actually have some other bits that uh, help you with the de decision of whether you which, which cache block you want to evict from the cache, if that decision becomes irrelevant in your cache at some point. What do you keep in the cache? What do you insert into the cache? You may actually have some more bits of metadata. So tag is essentially some metadata that describes the block. There, there has to be a valid bit. There has to be some portion of the address so that you can identify uh, what this data is associated, what, what, what memory address this, this data is from. But there could be optionally dirty bits, like modified bits. There could be optionally replacement policy bits so that the, it can enable you to make a better eviction decision in terms of which cache block you should evict. And there could be even other bits that help you make a better decision in terms of prefetching uh, or uh, insertion, et cetera. So we will talk about those later. But this is the conceptual picture, basically. So if you look at a logical organization of a cache, there are many questions over here. But one key question is, how do you map the chunks of the main memory address space to the blocks in the cache? In other words, which location in cache can a given main memory chunk be placed in? So you can think of this conceptually as this picture over here. So you may have a physical address space of 8 gigabytes, for example, and you divide it into chunks. I'm going to call them blocks later on, but for this picture, entertain me with, a, with the word chunk over here. Essentially, these are chunks of 64 bytes. They're essentially cache blocks. But basically, you have a mapping problem. You have many of these chunks in the physical address space, but your cache may have only four space for only four cache blocks. So how do you do the mapping, basically? Which, look, which cache block can a chunk be placed in, potentially? And we're going to discuss this mapping. In hardware, you need to have a simple function to enable this mapping. You, have to, you need to take the address, and some bits in the address specify which location can this chunk go to in the cache. And we're going to see different cache organizations that enable things. And they're going to differ in terms of the flexibility that they provide in terms of how many locations can a chunk be placed in to the cache. So here, there are four potential locations in the cache, right? as you can see. A chunk can go to only one location, potentially. That's called a direct map cache. You don't have any flexibility. Now, different chunks can also go to the same location, and they conflict with each other. So you have a problem over there. But if a chunk can go to any location in the cache, this is called fully associative. So you have full flexibility. But now you have a different choice. Which location should you put it in? OK, so uh, this is a pictorial. We're going to build up to these. But direct map cache means that uh, a given chunk in main memory can only be placed in one possible location in the cache here, based on the address space. It cannot be placed in any of the three places, other three places in this small toy cache that I'm showing you. This is called direct map. Direct map means there's only one mapping location for a given chunk. There's also the opposite. This is clearly uh, the most restrictive, right? There's also the opposite one, which is a chunk can be placed in any possible cache block in the cache. And we have four, so this chunk can go to any of them. So this is clearly more freedom. Uh, and this reduces what we will call your conflict misses, but it makes your cache more complicated as well. So this is simple. This is more complicated. But here, you, because of the flexibility, you have more management possibility of your cache. Okay, And there's an in-between thing called set associative. A chunk can go uh, more than, to more than one place, 
one potential cash block, but not to all possible cash blocks in the cache. So you have somewhere in between. And that's called set associative. And we will see that also. A chunk can go to a set of cash blocks, but not to the other sets. OK? So we're going to see this by building the cache. But before we build the cache, let's talk about more, some more basics. So I'm going to do, define more. A block, uh, I, now I'm going to define it a little bit more formally. This is really the unit of storage in the cache. This is also called a line. IBM terminology says line. Both are used actually in literature today, a cache block or cache line. Mem I'm going to use block. Memory is logically divided into blocks that map to potential locations in the cache. So I'm going to rename that chunk to block, basically. The memory chunks are also called memory blocks, let's say. They map to potential locations in the cache. OK, so on a reference, as we discussed, you get a hit or a miss on an access to the cache. Reference means access to the cache. If the address you're looking for, or the, uh, if the block is in the cache, if the block you're looking for, because whenever you access the cache, you're basically looking for the block. You may be looking for something inside the block, but you access the cache using the block address, basically. Uh, so how many uh, bytes in block doesn't matter initially, because uh, the granularity of access to the cache is in terms of the block. So if, if the block is in the cache, you use the cache data instead of accessing memory. Great. If the block is not in the cache, you need to br bring the block into the cache. And that's called a miss. So to be able to do that, you may have to evict some other block. This is called an eviction, meaning you replace something else in the cache. Okay? And whenever you evict something, you may have to write it back to memory. Also, because it may have been modified in the cache. The thing you're evicting, the block you're evicting, may have been modified in the cache because of a store instruction or write request into the cache. And as a result, it's dirty. And the memory doesn't have the updated value, depending on how you build your cache hierarchy. And as a result, you may have to write it back. So there's more complication now, right? Stores complicate the cache a little bit. OK, there are important cache design decisions we're going to look at one by one. Not all of them, maybe. Well, actually, we're going to tackle all of them in some uh, level of detail. We're going to look at placement a lot, for example. Uh, placement says, where does a block map to in the cache? How do you place it there? And how do you find a block in the cache? This is basically, how do you query the cache? Right? How do you place the block? Replacement means, what data do you remove to make room in the cache for an incoming block? Granularity of management says, what is your block size? Is it large or is it small? Can you actually do something like sub-blocking, which we will introduce? Now, this is going to be important because uh, it determines how many blocks you can house in the cache, right? And we're going to see the trade-offs in terms of large blocks, small blocks. And in hardware caches, usually you, you have a fixed block size. A not fixed block size, a variable block size, complicates the management significantly because now it becomes very difficult to address blocks, right? If you have, let's say, uh, variable size blocks, 10 different sizes of blocks. How do you address these different blocks? That becomes a problem. In software, this is not a problem. In software, you can complicate things. But in hardware, it becomes very complicated to manage different size blocks. So we have a fixed size block. Write policy, we will discuss openly. What do you do about writes? Whenever you write to a block in the cache, what do you do? Do you write to the next level? Do you write to the next level? Do you also write to memory? Or do you just not write to any other level, just this cache, and then you propagate the updated value later on when the block is evicted. So there are a bunch of write policies, actually, more than this as well. And then there's instructions versus data. Do we treat them separately? And in fact, instructions versus data, uh, there's a reason why the first level caches, L1 caches, are separate. L1 instruction, L1 data, because they're tightly integrated into different parts of the pipeline. Right? L1 instruction caches are needed in the fetch stage. L1 data caches are needed in the load access or store access stage. So they're different. But in the next level, L2 caches, do you have L2 instruction, L2 data separately? Because they have different access patterns, potentially, right? Instructions may, be more, may have more spatial locality than data, depending on your access patterns. So these are very interesting questions. There are also other questions in terms of hierarchy management. Like, uh, where do you place the data in, in the cache hierarchy? I think this was alluded to earlier. Do you place it only in L1 and then move it into L2 only when it's evicted from L1? Or do you place it into all memory hierarchy uh, levels or some memory hierarchy levels, depending on what you anticipate uh, uh, is going to be used, depending on the locality characteristics of the data. So these are interesting questions, clearly. We're not going to tackle all of them, but we're going to try to tackle as much, as much interesting things as possible. Uh, actually, clearly, caching is a very uh, interesting subject that has fascinated many people in the world, both software and hardware. In computer architecture, there are still cache papers being written. Uh, the earliest cache papers I showed you was from 1962. That's the earliest I could find. Uh, but today, we're in 2021, and people are still writing cache management papers, and people are still improving the cache designs in real processors. In fact, there's a funny uh, thing. Uh, the main uh, computer architecture conference where 
many uh, flagship uh, ideas were presented. One of the main conferences, the International Symposium on Co uh, Computer Architecture. But sometimes people make fun of it, saying that it's the International Symposium on Cache Architecture. Now, that's not true, of course, but there was some point where a good fraction, a large fraction of the papers that were published in this flagship conference were about cache management. Why? Well, it's so important. It's, it's most of your chip, basically, most of your system, actually. How do you manage this huge uh, data storage becomes very important for your performance, efficiency, reliability, and everything, essentially. That's why it's so important. Okay, now let me go into a little bit more uh, hardware. So cache abstraction, this is still abstraction, but a hardware cache is indexed using an address or searched or queried, I should say. And as I said, a cache has two distinct components, tag store and data store. And tag store houses the metadata about the data that's in the data store. Essentially, you have a tag associated with each data block. So as I showed you over here, let's go back over here, uh, this picture. You, each cache block has a data portion and a tag portion. We're going to decouple these structures in hardware. Tag portions of a cache block will be part of the tag store. Uh, data portions of the cache blocks will be part of the data store. So in hardware, we decouple them because we want to access them in different ways, potentially, right? as we will see for le later level caches. So they serve different purposes. You uh, query the tag store, ask the question, is the address in the cache? And the tag store can give you a hit or miss. Yes or no, basically. And if the answer is yes, while you're indexing the tag store, you may actually be indexing the data store. And the data store brings you, gives you the data associated with the tag uh, metadata. OK? So data store just stores memory blocks. Now, there are also interesting questions that we will discuss. Do you need to access them concurrently? At L1 caches, usually yes. But maybe at L3 caches, you, you may access them serially, right? OK, we're going to talk about that as well. But at this point, the abstraction is that tag store is the metadata that gives you the hit or miss signal. And data store gives you the data itself. OK, and we discussed you can calculate the cache hit rate. Uh, it's really number of hits divided by number of accesses to this level. And average memory access time, we kind of calculated earlier. It's the hit rate times hit latency plus miss rate times miss latency. So these are some metrics that you may be interested in that we may cover at some point. But there's an important aside that we're going to cover also, which I should let you know at this point, because it's important. The question is, is reducing average memory access time always beneficial for performance? And this may be something you may want to think about. Uh, and the answer is basically no. Reducing average memory access time is good. But as I mentioned in earlier lectures, this is ignoring something important, which is concurrency uh, in the system. So, uh, you may have a memory access and that its latency, uh, average memory access latency uh, is some, uh, let's say 100 uh, uh, cycles after all of these equations. Uh, and reducing that latency at the expense of uh, uh, reducing parallelism may not be a good idea. Meaning that latency may be overlapped by some other operations that are going on in the memory system. And if you actually reduce the latency but destroy the parallelism in the operations, you may actually have worse performance. So this is just to, again, tell you that latency is not the only factor that goes into performance. Right? Remember the performance equation? It's about execution time. It's not about latency in the end. And execution time is not affected just by average memory access time. It's also affected by how much of that latency actually gets exposed to the instructions, how much of that impacts actually the CPI, cycles per instruction. So keep in mind that reducing latency is not always good for performance. It may be bad sometimes, depending on how it changes things. OK, now let's talk about a basic hardware cache design. So we will start with a basic design. Then we will examine a multitude of ideas to make it better. And there are many ideas, as I said, so we'll be selective. So we're, we're going to look at main memory. It's going to be logically divided into fixed size chunks. I'll call them blocks also from now on. But cache can house only a limited number of blocks. This is true for any level of the cache. Main memory, for example, here at 8 gigabytes, each block is 64 bytes. So if you look at main memory, 8 gigabytes is 2 to the 33, uh, right? A chunk, a block is 2 to the 6 bytes. So you have 2 to the 27 blocks in main memory. In your cache, you have only space for 4. So the question is, how do you actually do the addressing, and where do they get mapped? So basically, each block address maps to a potential location in the cache determined by the index bits in the address. So we're going to use part of the address to index into the cache. 
And this is used to index into the tag and data stores. I'm going to show it pictorially. And this is going to be an example that I'm going to show you. But this is an example. We have a toy 8-bit 8 8 address. It's not the memory that I showed you earlier. This is a memory address, but it's a small memory in this case. If it's byte addressable, uh, you can calculate the size of the memory. It's 256 bytes, basically. Uh, and index bits may be these three bits that come from the middle. And by just looking at what I showed you over here, you can guess that a block is eight bytes in this particular cache. I'm going to more formally show it in the next slide. But we're going to look at a toy example, basically. And then the tag bits are the remaining bits. So we're going to index the cache and check, get the tag from there, and then check if the tag matches the tag of the address, block address that we are looking for. OK, so basically, I explained you the cache access. But more formally, let's take a look at what it means. So a cache access, you first index into the tag and data stores. These are memories with index bits in the address. You get the uh, tag from the tag store, you get two things, valid bit and the tag. You check the valid bit in the tag store. If it's not valid, then it's a cache miss because the cache doesn't store anything in that particular location. If it is valid, then you check the tags, meaning you compare the tag bits in the address with the stored tag in the tag store. I'm going to show you this pictorially in a little bit also. Uh, and if they match, if the valid bit is set and the tag bit that's stored in the index matches the tag bits of the address that you're looking for, then there's a hit. Then you declare that there's a cache hit. That means block is in the cache. And that's it, basically. Then you can get the data from the data store. Basically, if a block is in the cache, the stored tag should be valid and match the tag of the block, which means that somebody should have, earlier, the processor should have brought the uh, block into the cache, set the valid bits, set the tag bits into, in that appropriate index. OK. So hopefully this makes sense. Now let's uh, go into uh, more uh, an example. So we will examine a direct map cache first, as I said, and then we're going to build into fully associative and set associative. Well, uh, over time, we're going to build into fully associative. But direct map cache means a given main memory block can be placed in only one possible location in the cache, just like I showed you earlier. Now we're going to look at a toy example uh, that could fit in one slide, basically. So a toy example will have 256 byte memory, 64 byte cache, and eight byte blocks. This means that if you have a 64 byte cache and your block size is eight bytes, you can only store eight blocks in your cache, right? You have 266 byte memory, which is not big, and eight byte blocks. That means that you have 32 possible blocks in memory. So you have 32 block blocks in memory. Your cache has space for only eight. Then you, you need to have a mapping function, basically. OK, let's talk about this placement and access in the direct map cache. So I repeated what I said over here. We have byte addressable main memory, 256 bytes, 8 byte blocks. So memory has 32 blocks. And this is the main memory. This is your entire main memory. Assuming that the width of each block is 8 bytes, these are the block addresses. So each, uh, each address of a byte is, uh, so you have 8 bit addresses, as I showed you earlier, because you have 256 bytes and memory is byte addressable. But the block address is only 5 bits because you have only 32 blocks, right? We said that block size 8 bytes. So what we really care about here when we're indexing and comparing the tags in the cache is uh, the block address, that 5-bit address, even though I'm going to show you the 8-bit address in full in a little bit. But basically, this is your entire main memory, and I have basically annotated the addresses. This is, block at address, uh, this is block address 0, block address 1. This happens to be block address 8 over here, block address 16, block address 24, dot, dot, dot. OK. So we are going to assume a cache that can house 64 bytes and it's eight blocks. Clearly, eight byte blocks, so it has eight blocks. So a direct map cache says a block can go, go to only one location. So this is our tag store and data store, beautifully again. This is the valid bit that I showed you. This is the tag and this is data store. So how do we query the cache? So this is the valid and tag I showed you. So this is our 8-bit address. So the processor issues an 8-bit address. It's looking for this address. So it has uh, the, the, the least significant bits are specify the byte in block. There are eight bytes. The next uh, least significant bits are three bit index. Why three bits? Because you have eight possible indexes in the cache. And then the tag is the remaining bits, two bits over here. B is bits here. So what do we do uh, to query the cache? We basically use the index bits to index into the tag store and the data store concurrently. Okay. So if the uh, if the address is, uh, if, the, if you're looking for, for example, blocks 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, index bits are 0, 0, 0 over here. So the querying gives us this location 0, 0, 0 over here. It gives us a valid bit and a tag bits. 
and the data store gives us data. Now, what do we do? We compare the tags bits and we check if the valid bit is valid. If valid bit is not valid, then it's a miss for sure. If the valid bit is valid and tags match, then you get a hit. Only in that case, you get a hit in the cache, which means that somebody brought this block into the cache, set the valid bit and set the tag bits. And that's the block you're looking for. If you get a hit, then you get the data and then you can multiplex out the byte in block from the eight bytes. If you're looking for only one byte, for example, you can pick the byte you're looking for from those eight bytes, okay? So that's the simple indexing, basically. So if, the, if you get a miss, then what do you do? You bring the block eight bytes from the cache. What do you do? Basically, you set the valid bit to one. You set the tag bits to zero, zero, zero. Uh, sorry, zero, zero, if it's, uh, if it's block zero. And you write the data into the data store. That's how you update the cache. And you could keep updating the cache whenever you get a miss, basically. Okay. So clearly, this is easy to build in a hardware because you have simple indexing. This is a uh, random access memory, right? Uh, both tag store and data store. And then you have a comparator that compares a tag, simple content addressable memory, but just one, one place you, you compare. Right? So the downside of direct map cache is blocks with the same index contend for the same cache location. So, and, and they cause conflict misses when accessed consecutively. So let's take a look at this example. So if you, uh, I, I, there's, a, there's a reason why I colored block, uh, blocks that are green over here. Block 0, block 8, block 16, block 24, they all happen to have the same index bits, 0, 0, 0. And they all map to the index 0, 0, 0 and the tag store and the data store, which means that only one of them can be in the cache at a given time. Because there's no other way you can place any of these blocks into the cache because of the mapping function that I showed you over here, right? Which means that now, if your processor access pattern is not good from the perspective of this direct map cache, if you access, so if you let's take the good case, if you always access block zero once, block zero again, 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 except for the first time, you get cache hits, right? That's great. And then at some point, you access block eight. You put block eight into the cache. The first time you get a cache miss and you keep accessing block eight again, many, many times, you get cache hits on block eight. Now, what happens if you interleave access to block zero and block eight? If your access pattern is like block zero and then block eight, block zero, block eight, block zero, block eight, block zero, block eight, block zero, block eight. Now, this is a bad access pattern for a direct map cache because those two blocks conflict at the same location in the cache, index zero, zero, zero. You have to evict one block to make space for the other. And if you're doing simple management, whenever you're uh, getting a block, you're replacing the uh, or evicting uh, the already existing block, you get a 0% hit rate. That doesn't sound good. And that's the problem with direct map caches, basically. Multiple blocks in memory map to the same location or same block in the cache. And there's no other way, place you can place those blocks. As a result, if you have a bad access pattern like this, you get a 0% hit rate. OK, so let me more formally define. So in the direct map cache, two blocks in memory that map to the same index in the cache cannot be present in the cache at the same time. Direct map means one index has one entry, uh, uh, or one index can go to one possible location in the cache, essentially. If different blocks have the same index bits, too bad. And this can lead to a 0% hit rate if more than one block is accessed in an interleave manner map to the same index. So assume that, I, I've already given you this example. Assume address A and B have the same index bits, but different tag bits. This access pattern, A, B, 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 conflict in the cache index. And all access are conflict misses, basically, except for the first two, which are things that you bring into the cache, right? Everything else is conflict because they conflict in the cache. Even though, even though you may be accessing only those blocks, block zero and block eight, and none of the other parts of the cache are used, you get 0% hit rate because there's, you, even though other parts of the cache, other blocks in the cache or the indices in the cache cannot be used. You cannot place index 0, 0, 0 there because of the mapping function, as I said. So this, is, this sounds bad. Of course, you can imagine, uh, OK, maybe I'm not going to replace uh, the previous block in the cache, so I'm going to get a 50% hit rate. Yes, you may have smarter policies, but this is still not good. Uh, OK, so the set associativity is built uh, so that you, can ac you actually avoid such conflict misses. So the problem was addresses n and n plus 8 in our toy memory always conflict in the direct map cache, right? How do we avoid those conflicts? So what we had was we had a, uh, we had a mapping function. 
we had a mapping function of column of eight. And uh, one index can go to only one location. Why not have, why not enable one index uh, to go to two possible locations? So uh, in other words, if you think hardware, instead of having one column of eight possible blocks, have two columns of four possible blocks. So now I'm going to make my tag store looks like this and data store also look like this. So I'm going to make my index bit smaller. So I'm going to still index into the cache, but I'm now going to ha in have four possible indices and each possible index, I'm going to have space for two possible blocks. Okay. Now, if I have uh, to accommodate both block zero and block eight, block zero can go here, block eight can go here. And the data for the block zero can go here and block eight can go here. And I'm happy because both of them are in the cache. I don't get conflict misses. Now, what I've done is essentially, let me go back over here. This was the cache we started with, one column of eight blocks, very rigid mapping. I've made the mapping a little bit more flexible. Two columns of eight, uh, two columns of four, same number of blocks still, but one index can house two possible blocks. Now, if you have a bad access pattern like n and n plus eight, n plus eight, n, uh, n, n plus eight consecutively, you can accommodate both uh, block n and n plus eight over here, right? Okay, so how do you do that? Basically, you index into the cache, you get the valid bit and tag from both of these. These are called ways, by the way, ways of a cache. This is the way zero, way one. And an index is called a set now. It has a set of blocks as opposed to a single block. Uh, and you basically uh, need to check where, uh, the valid bit and tag of both. And hopefully one of them only match, right? Assuming if there's any that match. So there's some logic that determines hit. And if you get a hit, you select which of the data. So this way zero in the tag corresponds to this way zero in data. This way one in the tag store corresponds to way one in the data store. So this logic basically says, if I have a hit in way zero over here, I should select the data coming from way zero over here. And then you can decide which byte to get uh, out of those eight, by eight bytes, right? So now your index bits became smaller. Your tag bits became larger, right? Because that's what we did, right? Okay. Okay, so there's one question basically. Wouldn't now n and n plus four contend for one of the two slots? Absolutely, yes, that's true because your index bits are smaller, but n and n plus eight also contend for those slots. So there's more contention, yes, but if your access pattern is n and n plus eight, you solve the problem. But now, yes, you, n and n plus four also contend for those slots, yes. So certainly contention patterns change once your indices, uh, once your index bits or mapping function changes, right? Indexing is really a mapping function basically. Uh, so, uh, okay, so now you can take this to the next level. Right? This is called associative memory within the set. So if you look at the set, way zero and way one, you're accessing them concurrently and you can, you're doing the content addressable match. You're basically checking the content of the tags, right? And you determine a hit or miss based on the content match over here, tag match. So there's an associative memory that we're including. Clearly this is increasing the complexity of the cache. So there's a trade-off. It might need to come out as conflict better. So you get co fewer conflict misses in this type of cache, but then you get more complex, slower access and a larger tax store also. Why is it larger tax store? Because now your tax store tax size has increased. So there are disadvantages to this associative as well. As you can see, latency uh, can increase in this particular case. But now you can have the same question basically. Addresses 0, 8, 16. If you keep repeating them, well, unfortunately you have only two places in the cache. You're, you're back to square one, kind of. You get 0% miss rate if you mismanage your cache again. If you have a bad access pattern where you have three uh, blocks that you repeatedly accessing in an interlead manner and they happen to map to uh, uh, the same set. This is called a two-way associative cache. Basically two-way because in each index you have two possible locations, way zero and way one, essentially. So you can maybe run into conflict misses, again, in this case, by increasing the number of blocks that you're accessing in an interleaved manner. How do you solve it? You make the associativity higher. Now, instead of having two columns of four blocks, maybe have four columns of two blocks. And that's this picture. This is called a four-way set associative cache. Your tax store now looks like this. You have only two indices, zero, one, but now you have four possible things in your set. And data store also looks like this. This is the same picture. I just drew it in a different way so that I can accommodate the picture inside the same slide. But essentially, your logic to determine what it hits becomes more difficult because now you have more comparators. Uh, and also your mux becomes wider 
for the data stores or your latencies increase in this case also. And now your address looks a little bit different, right? Your index is only one bit now. And as you can see, you decide uh, based on that bit, which set you're accessing or your tag has become larger, even larger, four bits. So clearly likelihood of conflict misses are now even lower because you have more flexibility in the mapping. But now you have more tag compared to a wider data mux and larger tags. Now, if you push it to the limit, you have a full associative cache. So basically instead of having two columns, uh, sorry, uh, two, uh, four columns of, sorry, uh, let's go back over here. What I said over here as two columns of four blocks over here, right? Now we have four columns of two blocks. How, how about having eight columns of one block each? That's basically a fully associative cache. In this case, a block can be placed in any cache location. You eliminated the index bits. There are no more index bits. You're just comparing the tags. This is a fully associative cache. It's fully content addressable memory, if you will. You're, best, you're comparing five bits. These comparators are larger. You have more comparators, eight comparators over here. You have wider moxes. So clearly, these are, uh, this is longer latency, clearly. But you may be able to accommodate in your cycle time. It depends. But your conflict misses are even lower. And you have more, more potential to manage your cache. Now, basically, uh, you have a decision. Whenever you want to evict some block, which one do you evict? You have a lot of flexibility. You can evict any of the blocks in the cache. And remember, we have, only, we have eight blocks. It's a small cache. But we have a, a lot of potential choices over here. So that's great from a management perspective, but not so great from a complexity perspective, as you can see. OK, so basically, degree of associativity, uh, what I introduced you is the associativity. Uh, how many blocks can be placed in a given uh, set? Uh, this, you can also think of this as how many bits do you use to index the cache, right? Uh, OK, degree of associativity is how many blocks can map to the same index or set. Higher associativity gives you higher hit rate. Downside is slower cache access time. Hit latency and data access latency both increase. And you have more expensive hardware, more comparators. Comparators become larger. Uh, and you get diminishing returns from higher associativity. So average across many workloads. This is kind of like an industry slide because I don't have the exact data over here. But as associativity increases, hit rate initially increases a lot. But over time, uh, over uh, basically, you get diminishing returns. But again, this is very much workload dependent. So this is just a general picture average across many, many workloads. Think of it that way, uh, as opposed to uh, a given number. So a workload may actually really benefit from eight-way associative, but it may not benefit from one, two, four-way, or, three, or any, anywhere between one to uh, eight-way associative, right? Because you may actually have a conflicting pattern with eight things involved. And once you're eight-way associative or higher, that's great. So it really depends on the workload access pattern. So uh, there are issues in set associative cache. I'm going to finish uh, very soon. But think of each block in a set having a priority, indicating how important it is to keep the block in the cache. The key issue is how do you determine and adjust block priorities to decide what to keep in the cache and what to evict from the cache? Because clearly, you have, let's say you have a fully associative or set associative cache. Uh, you, you have uh, all the blocks uh, used in a set. And you have another incoming block that's different from uh, what is inside the set already. Then the question is, how do you adjust the block priorities? Do you bring the incoming block into the cache by evicting something else, or do you keep the existing blocks in the cache? There are many design choices here. And there are three key design decisions in a set, basically. And these are called insertion, promotion, and eviction. Eviction is also a replacement, basically. So insertion is what happens to priorities whenever you're filling a block into the cache. How do you change those? Do you increase the priority of the thing that you're filling in? You reduce the priorities of things that are not used. So you can imagine many different policies. I'm not going to give you any policy at this point. We're going to look at some policies later in the next lecture. So where to insert the incoming block, whether or not to insert the block. These are all questions, basically. And what do you do to the other blocks? Promotion is what happens to priorities on a cache hit. Cache hit gives you more information also. So basically, cache fill is giving you some information. Uh, this, this block is not in the cache. What, what am I going to do to the set? Cache hit also gives you more information. I hit, in, I hit this block in the cache. I re-referenced it. So I have more information. What do I do to the priorities? Do you change the block priority? How do you change the block priority? Do you reduce the block priority of other blocks that are not accessed? So there are many design choices over here. And then finally, eviction and replacement. This is what happens to priorities on a cache miss, essentially. When you get a cache miss, which block do you evict? How do you adjust the priorities of different blocks that are in the cache at that point? So set associative caches a lot, uh, enable a lot of decisions. In direct map caches, you have fewer decision. Uh, decision uh, space is smaller, basically, uh, because you basically either evict the block that's in the cache or not evict it. 
that's the decision you need to make. Whereas here, if you are set associative, if you have many potential blocks mapping into the cache, and an existing cache that could be 32-way or 64-way set associative, you may actually have 64 blocks mapping in a safe mapping to a safe, to the same index. In that case, you need to actually make a good decision if you want to manage your cache well. OK, uh, so eviction policy is which block in the set to replace on a cache miss. Uh, very quickly, you, in any invalid block, first, I already mentioned this basically. If you have an invalid block, you should replace it. It doesn't make sense to uh, replace a valid block if you already have an invalid block in the cache, right? Unless you have some other really, really good information about blocks. And if all are valid, you need to consult the replacement policy. That's also called an eviction policy, as I mentioned in the previous slide. And there are many replacement policies, and we're going to cover them in the next uh, lecture. But just to prime your thinking, it could be random. You could decide randomly to pick which one. It could be first in, first out. It could be least recently used. It could be not most recently used. It could be least frequently used. And these require different information, actually, to keep. Random doesn't require any information to keep. You flip a coin. Well, maybe a random number generator, but it depends on how truly random you want to be in this particular case. But uh, least recently used actually requires a priority ordering of the different blocks, as we will see in the next lecture. Not most recently used is easy. You just keep track of what's the most recently used block, right? So these differ in terms of uh, the amount of information you need to keep about blocks in a cache, right? Least costly to refetch. Memory access may have different costs. We're going to talk about that in the next lecture. There may be hybrid replacement policies. Again, we are going to briefly talk about that in the next lecture because one replacement policy is not good for all patterns. Earlier, one of your fellow students mentioned maybe branch prediction ideas can be applied to caches. Yes, absolutely. This hybrid replacement policy is very similar to hybrid branch predictors. Different access patterns may benefit from different replacement policies, and you may actually have different replacement policies to cater for them. What is the optimal replacement policy? We're going to talk about that as well. Uh, OK. And this is probably a great place to stop because after this, we're going to go into a little bit more detail into these management mechanisms, as well as other issues that arise in a memory hierarchy, in a modern memory hierarchy, in terms of how to manage the caches. Uh, before I conclude, I should also say that there are some backup slides uh, that have more examples on how to index the cache. I gave you a toy example. I think actually it's enough, but uh, these backup slides give you some more examples on uh, a larger address, for example in terms of how you address the cache, how you index the cache, what is the set associated with, et cetera. So if you're interested in looking at those, they're already uploaded, and you can take a look at uh, the backup slides. So uh, I, I guess uh, I will answer one question. There is a question saying, what makes a block invalid? So basically, uh, uh, the valid bit specifies whether the block is there or not. So what does it mean for a block to be invalid? That means that it didn't get fetched into the cache when you were querying the cache. That's what it means semantically, right? And Initially, when you start out uh, your system, all of the blocks in a cache are invalid, right? Because you didn't fetch anything into the cache. And this is designated by the valid bits in the cache. So hopefully this is clear. You have to have a valid bit because you have to distinguish whether the data that's stored randomly in that particular location is something that you loaded into the cache willingly or something that was there, that happened to be there. So the valid bit, no, it's not only for system startup. That's also a very good question. There's a question that asks, is it only for system startup? The answer is no, uh, because you may actually decide to invalidate a block for other reasons. And uh, this, is, this becomes more complicated, but uh, uh, well, what could, be, what could the other reasons be? Uh, in a multiprocessor, uh, two different processors may be caching the same location. And one processor may write to the location, which makes that, uh, which makes, uh, uh, the other processor's cache stale, which means that when this other processor is writing to its own cache, it should invalidate the other cache. That's one way of designing cache coherency. So yes, usually valid bits are also needed for the cache coherency protocol. In fact, cache coherency protocols, modern cache coherency protocols require even more bits uh, than the valid bits. They require more uh, like two or three or four bits in existing cache coherence protocols. So that's a very good question. But you may also decide uh, to invalidate it uh, because uh, uh, you're not going to use the cache block and you want to make it available for replacement, uh, for, for placement for other blocks, right? There could be other reasons uh, to invalidate it. OK, these are very good questions. Uh, and I think if there are no more questions, uh, we should stop at this point. Tomorrow, we're going to pick up where we left. 
And we're going to go more into caching, hopefully cover some really interesting topics. And then we're going to start virtual memory if time permits. Otherwise, we're going to start virtual memory uh, next week. Okay, take care, uh, and I will see you tomorrow.